Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to give this uh, seminar about something which I like a lot, which is graphene. And what I like the most is to play different games with different materials. And the message of my talk today is that when you have a new kid in town, which is graphene, you better go away from the usual design avenues in order to get the best out of the new material. And uh, this is my agenda for today. I will first give you some kind of short overview on graphene. What can graphene do and why it's so interesting and nice. Then I will give you some insight on how to create CMOS-alike graphene-based logic by essentially replacing the FET transistors with graphene-based FETs. And I'll give you some comparison to see what you can get by changing the conduction channel from a traditional FET with a conduction channel made of graphene. And then I will tell you something about a different way to utilize graphene then to go beyond switches, then not to seek a transistor, a graphene-based transistor, but to look for more complex structures which can do more computation. By just modulating the conductance of the graphene, we can obtain more complex behavior. And I will let you see how we can essentially implement in this way, very compact two, three input basic Boolean gates. I'll tell you something about majority gates and how to implement a full ladder and maybe also a, a static RAM cell. And again, I will give you some comparison and I will let you see that essentially speaking, because in the second option, we are doing a different game than the traditional Boolean algebra switches kind of marriage between FET and uh, the paradigm, the Boolean algebra paradigm, we can get better advantage. Okay, then graphene, you know, we all played with graphene since we were in a primary school. We didn't know that uh, when we were writing with the pencil on paper, we were actually using a lot of layers and if you take only one layer from the from the graphite you obtain a graphene structure which is a two-dimensional material and essentially there is only length and width there there, there is no thickness and everything is built with those uh, regular and nine structures with carbon atoms which are separated by 0.42 nanometer now, being a two-dimensional material, it has ultimate atom thickness. Uh, sorry, Mr. Professor, can we ask questions during your speech? Sure, sure, okay. anytime. This, Any this is a real picture, what, what I can see on the right? Uh, I'm afraid I'm not. <laughs> it looks like. <laughs> no, 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 it's an not a, it's a artistic impression. Okay. Sorry then, for interrupting. One thing which is very important from the electrical point of view is the fact that uh, graphene has ballistic transport, which means that if we are using it for electronics, it should provide better performance. It's a better conductor than copper and silicon. It's also a very good thermal conductor, can spread very um, fast the, the heat. And last but not least in this slide is biocompatible. Then carbon, we are carbon, graphene is carbon, then we put, when we are put together, we can do things in collaboration. And if one can manage to make uh, circuits, graphene only circuits, we can do some interesting things in, you know, 
healing some diseases, doing some prosthetics. Those, this might be one of the very attractive uh, properties of graphene. Quite sure this can be used also in a malefic way, but I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about using it for the good purpose. Now, it's very light. It's lighter than air. It's also very strong. You see, an elephant can uh, sit on it. And it's flexible, it's transparent. Then there, it has a lot of interesting property. And you may say this is essentially Panacea Universalis. We can use it at whatever we want. Then starting from, you know, military uh, equipment, uh, water purification, electronics, and we will essentially look into logic circuits. It has also some interesting capabilities for making uh, neural networks, again, due to that um, possibility to modulate the conductance, but that one will be in another talk. Now, if we look at the market, we can see that the market is exploding, and we can see that uh, essentially the electronics is increasing. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse. What is very uh, interesting to know, what is the price? Because one square meter of uh, silicon wafer, it's about $1,000 and one square meter of graphene, it's about 10 cents. Then uh, from the cost point of view, it's very attractive. You see that the market in uh, 2019 was in the about 80 million and the expectation is to go to 1 billion in 2027. European Union is actually putting a lot of money in this uh, graphene. It's one of the favorite kids of the European Union for um, research funding together with the BRAIN project. Okay, now having said that, let us look a bit towards where we want to go. And in order to do that, First, let us remember that we have three types of materials, insulator, metals, and semiconductors. And everything is related to the gap between the conduction and the valence band. And uh, essentially graphene can be metallic or metallic or semiconductor, depending on how you cut the graphene. Then there are here in the picture two cuts, the zigzag one and the armchair one, depending on how do you do the, the cutting. And the, arm, the, the armchair can be, in principle, metallic or semiconductor. Then there is no gap in graphene, but if we can create a gap, we can make it a switch and then we can use it for electronic. Then no gap, small gap. And the question is how to obtain that, how to control the gap. And uh, graphene has a very interesting property. What we, ha we see here, there are three shapes of graphene nano ribbons. Okay, one is rectangular, simple. And then, you know, I have here an L, a T, and what I call a butterfly. It looks like a butterfly in my imagination. And while this is metallic, those are essentially semiconducting just by changing the shape. See, the rectangular shape, it's always on. There is no region where there is no um, there is conduction is uh, no is zero, and uh, which means that in a rectangular shape you cannot do much except if you induce from the external source the creation of the gap. However, if you shape it like LT or like butterfly, just due to the shaping you have a, a gap which is about. Um, 
plus or minus 0.5 electron volts, which is okay. Then just by shaping, we obtain a structure which can be now utilized and switched from on to off because there is this uh, band gap which we created created by shaping the graphene. Now, having said that, let us try to see how to make logic, graphene logic. The straightforward solution will be to copy CMOS because that's very traditional, is very well established, and just replace the P and the N MOS transistors with transistors which are built with graphene. The hope here is that because the graphene is a better material, you can essentially take advantage of the ballistic transport in order to get better performance. And, you know, the, the community, the device community, they said, oh, yeah, we have a new material. Let us look it at, at ways to utilize this graphene as conduction channel. And you see here there are three types of transistors which are making use of uh, nano ribbons in order to, to, to create the, the channel. Essentially, the channel is now the nano ribbon, the, the green one in the picture. And each of this, those has some advantages and disadvantages. Then this is a Schottky barrier, and this is a MOS uh, GNR FET. And then, you know, I will not comment on why one and the other one is better. I will just look now at what happened if we take those devices then Schottky barrier graphene fat and MOS graphene fat and we use them in order to build fundamental basic gates and I talk here about inverter NAND nor XOR. Now if we look at the area there is close to nothing then this the comparison here is uh, with CMOS 60 nanometer. This is what I had access to when we look at uh, this. And area-wise, don't see much. If we look at the delay, we see that the short key barrier is essentially faster than 60 nanometer. Uh, sorry, CMOS. Mr. Professor, uh, which I can see here, it's it's typically a uh, silicon uh, type uh, structure where it's a substrate dielectric and so yes, yes. and uh, in fact uh, you are uh, you are place uh, that uh, nano graphene in like a very thin layer on top of the dielectric yes and on top of that you have the kind of uh, dielectric which act as a gate Yes, then uh, the short key barrier, it's essentially this green stuff, which is your channel, yeah. drain and source, and you have a gate with oxide under it, and you apply a voltage on the gate, and this will, you know, open or close. Uh, the difference between the first and the second one is that in the second one, you use graphene also for the electrodes of the drain and the source because there are some problems when you make the connection between metal and graphene. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, essentially speaking, this is like a transistor, but instead of creating the channel into silicon by the action of the gate, you control whatever is happening in the nano ribbon by the potential on the top gate. Very interesting, very interesting. Uh, okay. I am thinking to the noise, uh, comparing the noise performance uh, with the silicon based structures. Okay, do not shoot me because I'm not a device guy. I'm a computer engineering person and I'm just trying to make use of those devices. And anyway, I'm not advocating for these transistors. Because I think by just doing that, we cannot take advantage full advantage of whatever graphene can offer. 
Okay, sorry for the question. No, no problem. I mean, that's the point, right? We have a presentation and we should talk. Then, then the Schottky barrier, it's essentially faster than the CMOS. And uh, the other one, the MOSFET, uh, GNR FET is slower. If we look at the dynamic power, there is one order of magnitude uh, more hungry, power hungry, the Schottky barrier, which is not a surprise because it's faster. Uh, the MOS and the, the, the MOS uh, GNR FET and the CMOS are plus or minus the same. And if we look at the leakage, uh, the leakage of the Schottky barrier is essentially a lot larger, but the MOS GNR FET is doing better in terms of leakage. Then what we see is that area we didn't win much. In, I would say, maybe the most GNR fat is better because you see it has lower leakage, but it's slower. Then I do not see any kind of wow results. You are probably also familiar with the tunneling fat. And if you, tr if you try to make a fat with graphene, why not to make a tunneling fat? And here you have uh, four such proposals. Again, whatever you see green is graphene. And um, OK, these are kind of recent proposals. OK, recent, eight years old, maybe. And each of them has some advantages, like this one, uh, the second one, the one in reference five. It can operate in the terahertz. And um, if we now make use of the tunneling FET, we can revisit the evaluation and we can see that, as expected, it's slow, it's very slow, the tunneling FET, but is very good in terms of static power. There are 10 orders of magnitude better in terms of static power than the CMOS 60 nanometer. And area plus or minus the same and in here in the bottom part of the slide there is a table and the table it's about how to make an inverter with graphene nanoribbon and those are the width of the transistors the, the channel width for the N fat and the, for the PT fat. Remember, everything is in terms of it's in terms of A, which is the distance between the two uh, carbon atoms. And we see that, for example, if we look at the delay, if we combine 8.5 square root of 3A with square root of 3A, we get you know, the fastest device and can be difference of three orders of magnitude. That's very, that's kind of intriguing that you can obtain such a difference just by playing with this um, ratio, this factor, form factor. And you see similar phenomena also when we look at static power, like you see here, I hope you can see my mouse. I, I'm not sure if you can, but if we look, there is a difference between, you know, 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus 19. Okay, in the dynamic power, the difference is not that big. Then what, what we saw is that you can use it. There are some advantages. It's clear that the leakage can be better, but it's not much better in area. It's not fundamentally faster, or if it is faster, it's a lot more power hungry. Now, let us look for a better way to, to use graphene. Then this graphene has a nonlinear conductance. And the idea is to try to modulate the conductance in order to emulate another function than the switch the desired, a desired nonlinear function, then to obtain something like <coughs> in this um, 
diagram <coughs> to use the potential, the U potential, and by changing this potential to obtain such a nonlinear uh, conduct. And we have a hint <coughs> that this is possible because we saw that the shape of the nano ribbon is very important. We saw on the band gear, but we saw also on the ratio between the width of the two transistors. And having said that, what we did is we assumed such a sandwich. And in the top of this sandwich, we put a graphene nano ribbon, which is shaped with this butterfly structure. You will see that later on I will have other type of structures and we bias it and we apply here on those top gates some voltages and there is also a big gate where we can apply a voltage but for sure the action of this voltage it's a lot weaker because there are a lot of things between the nano ribbon and this big gate voltage while in here you have the metal electrode there is some oxide and if you put here a voltage it will influence the transport in this nano ribbon. And you see this is uh, essentially determined by the length of the device, the construction length, the width, the construction width, and we have also two other things, which are the position of the gates. And we carry on some simulations, then we have a very low level simulation, essentially it's an atomistic level simulation, where we construct the Hamiltonian of this uh, system. And based on this simulation, what we can obtain are conduction maps. And we have here such a conduction map. And this is, you know, I have the two gates, remember, I vary the potential from minus one to one on both of them. And this is the conduction map. Now, in different points, I have yellow or more blue. Now, this happens, we were just lucky, I can say, that this structure is essentially mimicking the truth table of the end. Because for an end, when at least one of the inputs is zero, the output is zero, and when both of them are one, this is a two input end, it's one. And this is exactly what we see here. Then I have three points, which are blue, corresponding to zero, zero, uh, zero, one, uh, one, zero, and a yellow point in here, which is corresponding to one, one. Then what I managed to observe is that this structure with these dimensions, if I apply on the gate values between zero and one, then I encode logic values as one volt, zero volt. The conductance of this nano ribbon will vary with two orders of magnitude. And for logic one, it's simple because I just have one point for logic zero, I have three points, which are not exactly the same value, but still they are good close enough. Then what I obtain, it's a device, it's a structure, which is mimicking the end function. I don't have yet a gate, but I manage to have a structure which I can control from outside, and that one is essentially mimicking the true table of an end. Now, if I put, I change a bit the structure and I put here three gates, I am lucky and I can find from the conduction map, now it's a three dimensional because I have three gates, I have those seven points which corresponds to zero and only when all the gates are one, I have an one. What I see is that I managed to squeeze more behavior into one device, but the separation between levels is getting smaller. This is giving me a warning and it's telling me, yes, it works. 
but you better do not push further because the separation will get smaller and smaller. And now what we did, we looked for those different structures and what you see here are conduction maps which are corresponding to all the fundamental function and or XOR, NAND, NOR, XNOR. Then I do not need any inverter to make from an end an end. I can just find a device, a structure of the a nano ribbon that will deliver that. And we also did for three inputs. Again, it's possible. The question is how do we get those uh, shapes? But that's an, I will comment on that a bit later when we'll have more of them. And those are the shapes. Then if I can pattern nano ribbons with those dimensions and I bias them with two or three gates, the conduction within that device will mimic whatever I want to mimic. Now, you see, it's very simple when I have a device to do a simulation and to see what I obtain. Because essentially speaking, I plug in the, the structure in the simulator, we apply voltages and we change them and then we record the conductance and we make such a map. The question is, if I have a map, can I determine a, uh, a topology? Then not having a topology and obtain a behavior, because that's straightforward if you have the simulation tools. The other way around, it's a bit more difficult. And we didn't manage yet to crack that nut. For sure, we have some insight, some understanding, because when we look for a certain behavior, we are essentially turning some knobs that we know what they will produce. But we do not have a formal method to say, this is the behavior, tell me what structure I should get. And there is something else. These are some structures which are delivering an end but there are a lot more which can deliver also on end. Bigger or smaller, better, but the space, the design space is very big and we didn't try to optimize because we are just trying to get some decent structures to demonstrate that this can work, at least in theory, because in practice we did not fabricate yet. But that's again another story. OK, now. What I obtained thus far is. Graphene nano ribbons, which conduction can mimic a certain function, but is not yet a gate because I don't have an output. I don't have a zero or a one at the output. Now. The idea of the complementary logic is the rescue here. Then instead of creating pull up and pull down with transistors and network of transistors, what I do is I put on the pull up a structure which is mimicking F. Then the conductance of this is mimicking F and on the pull down a structure which is mimicking F bar. And essentially speaking, I have now a gate. And this is a two input end gate. You see that the conductance, conductance maps are complementary. You see that now we are doing, you know, we are looking in more um, interesting uh, range for the voltage. Then this is operating between zero and 200 millivolts. Then 200 millivolts is uh, one. Then somehow the beautiful butterfly took a different shape here on the on the pull down. This is the description of the uh, structures, and here we essentially have um, a spice simulation for this gate. 
because we also have a model which is um, which we can utilize in SPICE in order to um, to make circuits with uh, structures including graphene nanoribbons. And this is a model that's another story. This is based on atomistic simulations and uh, in order to speed up the the simulation essentially for each basic structure we make a table and we use that table in spice initially what we had was was a mixed simulation with spice connected to matlab in order to compute the conductance of the nano ribbon but we have a better solution now and this is the end and we managed to find for a lot more structure actually we managed to find for whatever it's important and XOR. Yeah, you see XOR, which is a rather complex structure, we can do it with two devices. We can also do buffers and inverters and in here those are spy simulations and we see that if we apply the type of inputs this is the reaction of the NAND of the XOR, which is as it should, right? 1, 1 is 0, 0, 0 is 0, 0, 1 or 1, 0 is 1. Okay, now let us see what we obtain if we go for the second order, if you want, of phenomena, then do not look, do not try to make a transistor, do not try to make a switch. I think somebody need to be muted. I, I hear an echo. Okay, then uh, let us now see what happened and how the comparison looks. And now we compare with seven nanometer CMOS and we see that from the delay point of view, the our proposal is essentially better than seven nanometer CMOS in terms of delay. Okay, and once again, those structures are not optimized. We just try to get some topologies which are delivering the, the goods. If we look at the area, we are a lot more compact. We talk about uh, one order of magnitude, actually. Okay, close to two, two to one to two orders of magnitude. Is this a surprise? No, it isn't because we have less devices. While in CMOS you need transistors, a lot of them, we just have two structures, doesn't matter what we do. And if we look at power, we have two orders of magnitude lower power. Then by changing the paradigm and quitting the idea of making transistors and embracing the idea of embedding a more complex function in the structure, we managed to really take advantage of the, the, the new material. And uh, one observation is that for graphene, the smaller you make the device, the more, the, the better it is. While for CMOS, shrinking creates troubles. In graphene, expanding is making things more difficult. It is difficult to fabricate small structures, but if you can, they deliver better goods than larger structures. Okay, one extra comment about the last um, table in here. Then in here we also have uh, a proposal of doing uh, logic, graphene-based logic with PN junctions. And what we see that this proposal is better than what we have in terms of uh, delay. But once again, 
what we have is not optimized and we could do better. But it's more expensive in area. And what is very important is the fact that it's very power hungry. It's actually hungrier than CMOS, which means given today landscape with power becoming, you know, the most important parameter, we are still on the top. Now, I still have a few slides, not very many. Uh, the first one, it's about three input majority implementation. Why do we need three input majority? For the simple reason that the carry out of a full header, it's a three input majority. And if we can implement it in one gate, we can be very effective. And apparently we can because by combining these two structures with three gates, we obtain a majority. And the other reason why majority gate is important is for error correcting codex, which rely heavily rely on majority gates. And we see that if we do majority in our paradigm and in CMOS, we are a lot faster. We are a lot three orders of magnitude better in terms of area. And we are also three orders of magnitude better in terms of power. Oops. Now, because we have a majority and we know how to do XOR, we also tried and we created a three input XOR structure. And then with this, you know, with four nano ribbons, we obtain the full header. And again, we are doing a lot better in delay, area, and energy, which is not a surprise because we are more compact to begin with. And this is the spy simulation of the this uh, full header and essentially speaking is behaving as it should. And last, I we also look into the implementation of a SRAM cell with two inverters and two transistors, everything in graphene, because if you have the gates and if we have memory element, we can do, you know, at least the core of the logic, it's covered. And what we obtain here is, again, we have um, faster, more area, effective, better in terms of power, and we also have kind of good stability. And with this one, I kind of finish my talk. Then, essentially speaking, my message, what I wanted to convey is that if you have a new material, for sure, the new material can induce better performance in well-known structures. If it's replacing, you know, a material which is not that good and the new material has, you know, it's better parameters for that. However, the new material may have more potential. And if we utilize this potential, we can essentially do a lot better. And here it's a summary of exactly what I already told you. And you see the SRAM, it's also slightly better in terms of uh, resilience to DC noise. And this concludes my talk. The tall building is uh, the electrical engineering building at TU Delft. This is where I am supposed to go from time to time. I've not been there for um, more than six months, I guess. And now I'm giving you the talk from my office at home. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Mm, it's very quiet.
I think you took us by surprise. Why? Concluding uh, so fast. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I'm uh, curious how much of uh, what you presented to us uh, was uh, verified uh, in the real life in circuits and so on. Okay, then we tried to fabricate some things, but unfortunately we are not successful. This is, you know, this is not my field, you know, the clean room. But we will I still... know it, but hmm? the, the, uh, for that reason I asked you. No, no, it's, it's not, it's not a project which is just theoretical. The idea is to try to build those devices. And the first attempt, we were a bit too ambitious on the lithography. And um, what uh, we, what they obtained in the clean room was not good enough. And this means that we have to revisit the, uh, the concept and to see maybe we can look at uh, bigger uh, structures and to try to fabricate those. Our simulations are as good as it gets because I told you the conductance of the nano ribbon it's evaluated by you know low level atomistic level simulations and the combination in spice it's also okay now I'm, I would also like very much to to fabricate some devices and might be okay if we are lucky because we are thinking to submit a project. There is a collaboration and uh, maybe, in, I don't know, maybe one, two years from now, we might have experimental results. Yeah. Now, uh, that uh, nano ribbon, uh, it's a kind of very thin sheet. How thin is it's, it's uh, of the level of atomic? Yes, it's one, it's a mono, mono layer. But how there you are... can polish to, to be so thin? No, this the production of graphene is uh, of two types. It one process is exfoliation, then they take graph, graphite and with I don't know what magic, don't ask me because I don't know that, they manage to exfoliate and they obtain one uh, layer which is one atom thick. The other method is by chemical synthesis. And but now, it, it has to have it has to have a kind of me me mechanical st stress. Yes, yes. Such that, uh, can yes. it sustain at such a thin level? Apparently, it can, because they fabricate graph graphene with this exfoliation. We even have in Delft a startup company, which yes. is called Nano Layers which fabricates graphene, but there are, I know a company in Spain also, which is doing that. And those guys are producing graphene by means of mechanical exfoliation. Then they take a graphite and with, I don't know how, they obtain uh, a monolayer. The other way is by chemical synthesis. And apparently, by chemical synthesis, they can get a very good control of the dimensions. They can synthesize structures, which I think they have like three hexagon wide things, then very, very narrow structure, and they can do that with a very good precision. This entire, this technology is very much in infancy, but as you saw, there are people which are putting money and eventually it may or may not be successful. If uh, you think about the fact, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. Yes. Do, do you have a pre prediction? When you expect to have a real structure? Huh. 
then to me, if we are lucky and we get the money to make that project, probably within two, three years for now, we'll have some structures. We can but also can you have see for the, for the future, can you see replacing the traditional silicon with these uh, new type structures? Can you see in time uh, replacing? If the industry will push for it, it will happen because graphene is also good for many other things. A lot of people are, are looking for graphene sensors. Uh, they also look for um, high frequency kind of uh, applications. Then because of the fact that it's so multi-functional, uh, if you want, it might get a good promise and it might replace silicon one day. That's a, you know, it's very hard to be a prophet. And it's also dangerous, right? Remember, we tend to kill the prophets. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anyway, I think for most of us, uh, we need a more basically introduction to this field because of course, uh, you have a lot of uh, knowledge on that, but we are only silicon based. Yeah, sure, but the, the discussion is mostly at the conceptual level. Then the, uh, the fundamental idea is that this new material can be controlled to obtain, to provide a different behavior than a switch. And this if you clear. can do that, why use it as a switch? Thank you very much. And we also have work on spiking neurons because there are interesting phenomena which are happening at the interface, then uh, trapping and detrapping of charges, which create a sort of memory. Then uh, with few devices, we managed to demonstrate at the conceptual level again that you can make a synapse and a neuron, spiking neuron, and it's from carbon, right? It's graphene. It's an artificial spiking neuron, which is very much alike to the neurons that we have in our brain. There is potential, but it's not something which will happen tomorrow, for sure. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Then I have, a, I have a question uh, uh, that may uh, Look surprising uh, as you declare uh, your your uh, main field uh, as being a computing engineer. Uh, however, I like the the idea of looking at this uh, new material not as a substitute uh, to what's already done in in uh, uh, silicon, but uh, potentially something new. Mm -hmm. So, uh, can you think about uh, a similar approach to? analog functions. The basic analog function is uh, voltage to current conversion mm -hmm. or, you know, a controlled. If we if we are given a controlled current source, we are very happy and we'll do amplifiers and all sorts of things with it. But if you look at the nano ribbon, essentially what the nano ribbon is doing is you get a current which is controlled externally by some gates. Right. Then it is a source current, controlled source current. We didn't look in analog type of uh, things, even though if when we are looking for the neuron, uh, the story there is more analog. And I do not see why you should not be able to obtain something interesting in this way for analog design. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, again, all I need yeah. is uh, is a high enough impedance on the control port, and I take it that's there. Mm 
because uh, the top layer is insulated from uh, mm -hmm. right and then uh, large enough uh, impedance on the let's say the output port that is the uh, the port uh, where the uh, current flows is that uh, there it's what what kind of kind of equivalent impedance if you want we can hope that, I, that I cannot tell you because we okay you are looking a bit different at the issue and I yes. understand your point but I think this depends very much on what you put next because you will control a current within this nano ribbon and that current will have a certain behavior what you want to obtain but the, the impedance further well, no, the, the equivalent impedance. The next stage, you mean? Yeah. No, the, the, the equivalent uh, impedance, uh, uh, I would see. Yes, I understand. Right. And 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 then, you know, once once uh, we have that, uh, we have gain uh, and uh, uh, with with uh, small uh, uh, power uh, dissipation in the control port, that's fine. So I suppose the only other thing would be what's the relationship between uh, uh, the, the current and the control voltage. But you know, any, pretty much anything will do. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I think you can use the idea also for analog. Now, what we have in our case is because we are looking for logic. Right. What we have to obtain, it's an input-output compatible structure. Then we attack the gates with uh, zero to 100 millivolts. And we seek to have an output, which is in, again in zero to 100 millivolts. That's the, the point that we have in mind. Right. Now you want to go into analog, then I, in analog, I'm not exactly at home. I, I think there are a lot of people here around which are analog uh, designers. Yeah, Professor Nag, Marius here. So <laughs> I, we implemented that, that thing that you, that you mentioned. So we implemented the digital to analog converter, uh, five bit true. digital to analog converter with these current sources. So it works. We managed to get a good linearity on a five-bit level. Sorry, Marius, I forgot about that. <laughs> no worries. Okay, uh, then uh, you see, you could answer yeah. the question. Yeah. yeah. Then it is possible. It is possible, yes. Okay. And there is yeah, something thanks. very nice about um, we also observe the fact that, that we can obtain some kind of periodicity of the conductions, conductance. Then we can, then the conduction is going up, down, up, down with a certain period. And uh, this can also have some implications on the implementation of some functions which are called symmetric functions, but that's not part of this talk. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Professor.